Financial and Security Oil and Water. Um, my name is Ron Parker. I have a terrible southern accent. It's kind of draw at a time. I just kind of go all over the place. So I apologize that up front and first. Uh, I actually work for a large ins insurance company, largest disability insurance company in the United States. I'm a security architect there, have worked with um, development, large system installation, security, stuff like that forever and ever. And uh, recently have worked more and more with uh, the push toward Agile. And when I say Agile, I'm not really here to talk today about whether that's big Agile or little Agile or all those other crazy things that you can talk about. Uh, we're, we're going to talk about Agile and, and, and security. And if you'll notice, this is a uh, this is a blue room, blue blue deal here. Most of the people here today, you know, they they're not blue. They're probably more of the red team. And you notice the red team when they're driving around, you know, in their hoodies and their cars and their paparazzi off to the side and they all their news. You know, that's 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 them. We're, we're over here on the blue side trying to protect the protect the homeland and the red shirt people. We know what happens to them at the end of the day. You, you really do want to be blue team people. You really do. And, and that's what we're going to, going to keep on working towards. And we're here today to really, to really talk about the sad story of salad dressing. And, you know, I know what you're saying. You're saying, hey, I've heard this before. And, but just, just bear with me. You, you, you probably want to, want to hear this again. So when we talk about salad dressing, you know, usually I, I cook a lot. I like to cook. I like to, because the end result of cooking is eating. Yes, that's, that's good. It always comes up good. Um, so I think the best, best kind of salad dressing out there is the homemade kind. So I go grab a bottle. I don't grab any bottle. I grab a, a nice bottle that's around because I want it to look decent. So I, I go get my bottle and I, I halfway fill up my bottle with, you know, some kind of good vinegar and, I go digging around and I put some other stuff in and, and then I always put, uh, put oil in with, with my vinegar. If you notice right away, you know, I can see the oil and I can see the vinegar and that's kind of what uh, happens naturally there. If you, if you look, we've got um, no mixing. They separate on their own and the oil, the oil floats to the top of the vinegar and it's just kind of kind of stays that way, but I know that, it's salad dressing. So I pick the bottle up and I shake it, shake it, shake it, set the bottle back down and immediately what happens? All of a sudden, all of my, my, my nice stuff and my oil and stuff starts to separate, all that oil goes to the top. So I say, hey, I, I can fix this. So I pick it up and I shake and shake and shake again, set it back down and, it, and it's kind of still that way. So by now, I have an oil slick on my shirt. I have sprayed salad dressing on everyone in the, in, in the room. When I pour this stuff out, it tastes like, who knows what it tastes like. It's nasty in the bowl. Everything's just a, just a mess. So when, it, when I look at this, I put all of this effort, I put all this effort in, yet no one's happy. I'm not happy because I've got salad dressing all over me. People aren't happy because their salad tastes like, oh, by the way, if you're not, I know, if you're big meat eater, paleo, whatever, pretend that you're going to put this on a steak or something, okay? Just so, there's no salad involved. It's actually steak dressing, so just pretend that. So, you know, I put all this effort in, and I shake, shake, shake this stuff, and I put it down, and it just doesn't mix correctly. It just doesn't mix naturally. And... That's our problem because, you know, some things just don't mix well. When, when we look at them, they don't, don't mix naturally. <coughs> so when we, when, we, when we begin to look a little bit closer, you know, these things don't go together on their own. So what, what does that have to do? So let's, let's look a little bit. Let's look at Agile and Security then, talking about things that, maybe might not mix. Um, when most people think about development and security, is the first thing that comes to your mind, oh, 
that's one of the happiest, best things we have where I work is development and security. Everyone loves to do that together. Right? I see everybody, yeah, happy times. Uh, no, truth be told, most people don't want to mix those two things. Most people just don't, just don't care. Um, so let's talk a minute first. Let's back up and let's talk about what, what do we mean by, by Agile. And not going to go into every methodology, everything that's out there, but, but I do think there are some things that we need to talk about and look about Agile and what makes it different. And it really, it really is more than, and I'm going to rattle off some stuff here. First of all, how many people are doing or doing what they think is Agile where they're at now today? How many people want to do Agile or think they may be forced to do it at gunpoint at some time? Okay. Um, so when we look at this, I'm not really going to talk specifically about Scrum or Kanban or Scrumbon or, or Lean or any of those other Agile methodologies that are out there. I'm going to talk about Agile in a generic kind of way. And there are things that make Agile, Agile. When we look at teams, there's a lot of differences. They're, they're accountable. They're more accountable than the old way. They're self-organizing. You know, the teams that come together to do their work they kind of work on the problem on their own and they get their, the, the, the resolution on their own. They move at their own pace. You know, they get together, they look at that problem, they figure out how to solve that problem, and whether they go slow or whether they go fast, they're moving at their own pace. And they're using their own methods. So when we look at that, a lot of times you'll have Agile, I'll, I may have a business with three Agile teams and they still may be operating a little bit differently. Each Agile team may have come up with kind of a little bit of a different way to move forward. And so when we put all this together, we start seeing that these teams don't really want to work with anyone else because they're working at a certain speed. They don't really want to wait on anyone else. They're trying to do continuous improvement. They're trying to make themselves better. They don't have time for anyone else to come in. But the good part is, a couple of things that the Agile teams have in the Agile movement is, is a, is a goal of you know, customer first and quality and, and some of these other things, and, and that's a good deal. So when we look at the Agile model, a lot of times if you'll kind of look at the picture, you'll have a team, but that team will be coordinated somehow, and that team still has to work with non-Agile parts. So when I talk about Agile, this is kind of what I'm talking about. You know, something that looks like this. So that takes us on. And, and so what I'm, not, what I'm not talking about then is waterfall, big design up front. Hey, let's figure everything out before we write a single line of code. That's not Agile. So as we look at, so we look at security, it's like, oh man, you know, there's a, there's a lot to security. Uh, and, and basically we hear all the time about, CIA, we hear about confidentiality and integrity, we hear about those things. Privacy is very important today. Privacy is, is on every company's mind. If you have customer data, you had better be worried about privacy. If you are a regulated company, you need to be worried about compliance. And this is, we don't, we don't talk about this a lot, but it's there. You know, ask, ask some of the, the, the companies out there, what does brand matter? You know, there have been companies, you know, we talk about Target and yeah, their stock was affected, they'll live, they'll make it. There are other companies though that were affected that are actually out of business. We don't talk about those enough. And you think about that, that's the ultimate brand. <laughs> what, what's the ultimate thing to hurt your brand? I went out of business. You know, that, that's as bad as it gets. So we take those high level thoughts that are in security and we try to drive that through with our policies, our standards, you know, our directions and guidelines and so forth. And so when I look at security, it's a much bigger umbrella than what a lot of people see and know about. Because when we talk about security, especially here at B-Sides, a lot of what you see is, you know, pen testing, blue team, red team type stuff. The umbrella is bigger than that. You know, when, when we look, there's the whole identity management piece. How do we deal with identities? You know, that's, a, that's horribly complex. Access management. Once I have an identity, what does it connect to? You know, there, there's a whole discipline to that. Vulnerability management. 
you know, we, we've talked about that some here today about finding them, patching them, what, how do we deal with it. The stuff that we do know about, like secure coding, secure testing, you know, that makes sense. But there are, there are more complications. Cloud and, and, and mobile are really changing the landscape we have today. So after you read all this, you're just tired. You, you know, you look at all this and you go, man, I'm tired. You know, so what do we have to do? You know, when I'm looking at this, how do I do this? How, how many, and I don't, you, may, you don't have to answer this because this may be super secret. You know, do you know your ratios of security people to developers? You know, consultants to developers, do you know that ratio? Is it, is it high, low? Do you have one per one, one per 100, one per 500? <laughs> you know, what is that ratio? Because my guess is, whatever it is, you don't have enough people. You don't have enough people to scale security to where it needs to be. My guess is the developers are many more and they're outrunning you no matter what you do. Um, that's, just a, that's just a guess. You know, what is, your, what is your coverage? Do you know if you're covered? And that's, that brings us really to the, the problem here. What's our assurance of security across the company? How do I believe, what do I believe, what do I know about security really happening across the, across the company? You know, the business needs to know and the business wants to know, are we doing things securely? And can you as security people answer that in any way? I know the pen, te the, the pen testers, red team, blue team, they can run out and say we've had 12.2 million attacks against our whatever DMZ firewall thingy, and we stopped every one of them, you know. But what can we do as developers to go to the, you know, develop the security developer uh, areas? What can we do to go to the business and say, here's, here's how secure we are. Here's our level of assurance. So when we look at this, what we really need is we need that mix of you know, agile, the, you know, agile approach. We need that mix for of security to be there. We don't need to just do security or just new development or just do agile. We need a mix of these things. Security needs to mix with this agile approach. We can't sit on the sidelines and casually watch this, you know, kind of go by. So let's talk about mixing security and agile. So here what we have is a big blue circle for security and we've got this red squiggly looking circle down the bottom for Agile. So one of the things that, that we'll want to do is we, want, we, we will apply effort to both sides. We will go to the security people and say, I want you to act this way. We'll go to the developer people and we'll say, we want you to do this. Then we'll break things up into little parts and we'll start you know, beating people to, to tell them what to do. And security people, you know, can work on this to make it, but it takes a lot of work. So what we do is we put in an incredible amount of meetings. How many, you know, we get, we call meetings for security people to come and do stuff. We set up meetings to do this. We pull these people in, those people in. We make them watch videos and answer questions or whatever we do that's torturous, we do it. And, and so what happens is we put all this effort in, takes a lot of work. I stop and turn my back or go on vacation and pretty much immediately, you know, this is, this is what happens the minute I, minute I don't look. So what, what do we do when we're right back to here? What do we do when we're right back to where, you know, we started? You know, that's really the situation, but, but seriously though, seriously, it, it, takes, it takes effort to get anywhere. And we know to this point that they haven't been mixing. They really haven't. And what, what does that mean? What that means is there's a lot of bad stuff that actually happens here uh, when, this, when this goes on. We have too many meetings, you know, that are security driven. We have development teams that, how many, how many people in here have made a development team wait? No one? That's amazing. You might have. I know you have. You know, if you, you know, 
Oh, okay, if you're a how many of you are developers who are waiting on the security team? Okay, uh, that's no good. You can't. You know, we don't want that. Nobody likes that. You know, insecure code gets out. We don't do the correct testing. We're not looking at you know, you know, data issues, privacy issues. Nobody's even doing the, that old OWASP top ten thing, and we ask the same questions over and over again. You know. And, and it really does come down to it's just not a natural mix. So what, what do we see as a root? What do we start seeing as the root cause of this thing? There's a knowledge issue. My knowledge as a security person is different than your knowledge as a developing person. We have totally different types of knowledge. And it's not at hand. It's not easy. My knowledge isn't at hand for you. It's not easy to get to. My knowledge is just not there for you. We're running at different speeds. I'm writing a book every time you ask a question. You're trying to write code. You know, those are two totally different speeds. You're running and I'm kind of like slowing you down. There's also, we have different time frames. You're trying to produce something. I'm trying to protect something. You know, totally different. And then there's different people. Is your boss my boss? No, we have different hierarchies, different structures, different goals. So there is no way that, you know, I can go to you and say, hey, you really need to do this. What's in place to, for you to care? You know, why do you have to care? And, and also there's the big problem of the number of people. You know, there's probably a lot fewer security people than there are, are development people. So we, we look at this, and a lot of it amounts to people just don't know. You know, they, they, they just don't know, both sides. So, what's the real reason that we want this to mix? Everybody's got goals, but it really does come down to, we need to be doing more than just development and more than just security. We need secure development. We really do. And not just lip service either. We need something very special. We need something we haven't really had up to this point. We, we, need, we need a rainbow unicorn butterfly kitten. We need something that special to pull all this together. So, seriously, we do. So when we look to try to, to get these goals to where they make sense, I think we can look at three things. There are three things that you're going to hear me talk about the rest of the time. That is, I want to make security an enabler. I want to enable people with knowledge and process. I know in Agile, process is bad, but at the same time, I need to give you enough process to where you can go on. I need to scale security with enabled people. I can't take a bunch of ig ignorant people, right, and scale it out. I make them knowledgeable people who have process, and that can scale out security. Then what does that do? that raises my level of assurance of how good security is. I get that assurance from having those enabled people scaled out. So if I go enable one developer, that probably isn't, you know, if I've got one, develop, if I've got one developer enabled, he's ready to go, but I've got a thousand more who aren't, I haven't scaled properly. I haven't really done a whole lot. There's still, you know, that's still kind of a mess. That's not giving me the, the assurance, you know, that I really need. So what we need to do is really, we need to address the dressing. So now let's go back and let's talk about the dressing. You know, what were we trying to accomplish? We were trying to accomplish the mixing of those things because we wanted a good mix that when applied would come out in the end and everything would be together. That's what I was trying to do with that, that, that addressing. And I was also trying not to work myself to death. I could take that salad dressing, and shake it up like crazy, pour and shake and pour and shake and make a mess, and it may work. But I don't, I'm lazy. I don't want to do that. So, so in looking at that dressing, and there he is. He's still sitting there, just like he was when we left him. You know, what can I do to make this take a lot less effort? What can bring all this together? So what we're looking at here, we need to add something to the mix. We need to add a third party to this mix. The third party here 
is you got to brace yourself. Everybody set up straight. This is science, so I know, I know it could be rough. We need to actually add, we're going to add this honey. We put it in there, we shake, science happens, and now all of a sudden my dressing is mixed. And it'll stay that way. I can set it on the shelf and it'll stay that way. All of a sudden, I made a little change that made a big change in the end. So what in the world did I add? What did I do? I actually added an emulsifier. That's what I actually did. Does anybody know what an emulsifier is? Sure you do. You're all smart people. So an emulsifier, I'll talk to myself. An emulsifier is something that brings two other things together. The emulsifier is it's the piece that likes both oil and water. So when I add an emulsifier, it brings those two things together. So when I added it to the mix, it actually caused it to stay mixed. So for salad dressing, there are lots of, you know, if you didn't know this, there are lots of emulsifiers. Honey's an emulsifier. You'll see mustard in salad dressings because it's an emulsifier. You'll see egg yolks because it's an emulsifier. That's why you put it in there because everything will stay good and mixed. So let's go back and let's start again with our circles. And now let's look at what we need to do. Let's add an emulsifier. So I come through this mix. I put a little bit of effort in. Shake around. I have this science happening in the middle. And then all of a sudden I come out in the end with distributed pieces. I have blue connected to red and it stays that way. I have, I have reasons for this thing to happen. It's distributed the way it needs to be. That's the science. But what? What in the world, you know, what can we do to bring Security and Agile together? We've been talking about salad dressing. What, what can I do for Security and Agile to actually bring things together? What is our emulsifier? You know, what do we need from a security and development side? Simple answer, it's going to be a security development life cycle. That's our simple answer. It is our security emulsifier. That is the thing that we actually need. And I'm not talking about government-spawned SDL nasty nastiness. I, I'm, t I'm really going to go through this and, and, well, I know what you're saying. You're saying, wait. I've heard this before. We've been listening to you for 30 minutes and I've heard this before. I feel cheated. Well, this is not a rehash. This is actually different. It's different because of the way that we're going to apply it. So, as we look forward, this is not a rehash. So, when we look at SDL, we look at how does it solve those three things. It enables people to work for themselves. It, it scales because it's knowledge driven. It adds that level of assurance because the assurance is, is we, we check at the correct times. We know what's important. We have a framework out there that makes things happen. It really does enable and empower people. And we're going to go through the two things. We're going to go through and kind of show you what this is, but we're also going to show you how to implement this correctly. And I think that that's the important piece because so many times what we've seen with SDLs is people th kind of throw it out there on the table and expect it to grow like weeds and it just never does. So normal impl implementations, when I look at a normal implementation, I see big SDL models. I see agile teams trying to work with security people. They put in a request. The security people they never write, well, this is a secret, security people never write anything down. It's all tribal knowledge, it's in their head. So when you ask them a question, they make up the answer right about the time you ask them, but, but they won't answer right away. They won't answer you right away. No, no. They'll say, well, we have a so-and-so document standard policy thing in the repository on that. I'll get back to you. They hang up, they call their buddies, they all talk about it and they do a secret vote and a handshake. And then they wait, wait a week to get back with you. That's what happens right now. That's what happens in... Well, I, hey, I, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. So the problem with the, the old way is this is called, and this is important, this is called a push model, not a pull model. 
you're having as a developer we are pushing work on you we're telling you when we're going to meet we're telling you when this is going to be ready you are not able to you know move as you want to move because this stuff is actually not flowing too well and that's the problem with the traditional sdl is it is based on that push model chances are it has tribal knowledge all those nasty things in there what we need to do is we need to look at an agile implementation where we change that around we want to turn this into a pool model and the pool model means when you're ready you go get the work that you need to do you put that work in your queue on your board in your backlog or whatever other magical thing that you have you drive it not the security person now this takes work but this is what you have to do because your agile people need to do the work when they need to do the work so the pool model sets it up to where i can have one or more agile teams running at whatever speed they need to run and if you notice down the bottom right hand corner the security person he needs to do a lot of work but his work is to feed the sdl is to set up the repository correctly is to set up that checklist correctly to where it will enable the other people doing the work so when we look at this the big difference as you go back and because I know after this you're going to immediately run to your car download this presentation and read it again so when you're in your car looking at this again here shortly before you go to the after party when you're looking at this it's the pull and the push thing that needs to stick in your head you've got to figure out how do I make security a pull and not a push so one of the things in looking at it then is get away from going to that security person every time enabling the developers giving them what I need so SDL is our security emulsifier so how do we get one how do we get the right one how do we do the right the right thing that's really like the halftime question you know I've got the answer now how do I how do I really do that and since it's halftime let's talk about checklist we already heard a time or two today you've heard a couple of people talk about the importance of checklist checklists are crazily important if you've had surgery lately you had people reading a checklist when you had surgery if you like we heard this morning if you take off in a plane people are reading a checklist and they're doing it because in complex or high pressure situations you don't want mistakes development can be com complex security can be complex so it's just another reason that doctors astronauts pilots scrum masters all can use a checklist so when we look at this you know that checklist truly is a reminder it is a reminder for what you should do and it's kind of interesting this particular page is actually out of the Apollo one of the Apollo checklist when they when they went to the moon and they basically said it was the fourth crew member on the ship the checklist actually was and they actually basically read their way to the moon because they were following their checklist and something else the checklist tells you about that we that's important is what if something goes wrong it gives you alternate paths it gives you things to do right away so that's the same thing that we can do in development we can set up alternate paths we can give people you know options so where do we get our checklist we get our checklist there is one good source um, right away we can jump out and go to open sam is anybody familiar with open sam that's great uh, open sam is from OWASP they actually sat down and said hey if I'm going to build a security organization or an SDL or whatever what, what do I need to do so they built they built this model that basically has four major functions governance construction verification they went under each one of those then and said if I was a good security shop here's what I would do and so then you see these security practices like you need to do code review view you need to do security testing you need to do threat assessment so it actually goes through and tells you these are good things to do and it also if you don't have a security program in place 
it helps you put a security program in place. So when we begin to look at it with these four functions, you'll notice governance, construction, verification, deployment. Those are really types of work. Now this is an important distinction. Those are types of work, not the order that you would necessarily do the work. Does that, does that make sense? Because these, these are great, but not necessarily the, the way you want to go about it. So what we have to do then is, we take each one of these functions, we look at that practice. For example, this is security requirements. And everybody, you know, that's a real popular one. Hey, we actually need to have security requirements. And, and so we look at that and you figure out, what, how do we do that? So they come up with a maturity model. And they have three. They're not CMMI compliant or anything. They basically have three levels of maturity, you know, one, two, three. And if you look at that security requirement one, it says two very basic things you need to do. You need to have security requirements from business functionality. In other words, the business needs to operate. How do I get those business requirements? Then I need to look outside of the business and say, what compliance requirements do I have? I would also add in there what privacy, you know, that's a big one. You're going to hear me say this a couple more times. This is not complete. This is a list to show you a structure and a list to show you how to get started, but it is not complete. You will have to sit down with your, you know, your business and work it out and fill out that list. So we look at this. There's also different levels. As you go up in levels, they... Uh, they get a little bit more rigorous. Like the third level, they want you to actually audit. You know, so, so that's way on, down the, way on down the list. And once again, there's a little bit more detail um, about the actual activity. And this, I would say, this is completely out of their, their PDF, their online spot. You would definitely want to change that. So what we have to do in, to make this work is, if you look, these are some random methodologies. And each one of these methodologies have wheels and phases and, you know, sub variants, something and others. <laughs> you know, they've all got all these pieces and parts. That's too many because what we don't want to do with security, and this is huge, we can't go inject ourselves. We can't go to each one of these methodologies and basically tailor it to that methodology. I don't have enough time. You don't have enough time to do that. So what we need to do is make our own checklist and let everyone use that. I can't go to each one of these because you know why? Developers, I know there's not any in here. Developers and project managers are going to change their mind every day and do something different every day and they're going to pick a different methodology depending on which way the wind blows. You know, we don't want to do that. We, we need to build, build something a little bit more stable. So what do we do? We come up with phases. We actually have four generic phases that we put all this stuff into. Let's call it inception. Let's do these things at the beginning of a project. Let's do these other things in iteration one or more times as you go through your work. If you're doing waterfall, you'd do it once. If you're doing agile, you're going to do it every time you do whatever. Release is when you actually produce something. External is a complicated one. A lot of times with agile, you're running in what? Are you running in sprints? What are you running in? Sprints? Everybody doing sprints? You've got some two-week sprint maybe? Two-week? you got a two-week sprint. There are other activities that fall outside that two-week sprint that may be bigger than your two-week sprint. And so those activities are external activities that can't fall within normal development time. Maybe you've got to do a vendor evaluation or something that takes a really long time. So you have to kind of watch that. But those are four generic phases that kind of tell you what and when. So then we take all these activities that I start with. I go to the SAM and I pick these activities out. I put those activities in each one of our generic phases. So now I can say, with iteration, you need to do non-functional security requirements. You need to do an attacker profile. You need to do security stories. I can put all that in the correct spot. And even down, like I say, in the external, uh, whatever I need to do there, and that's going to kind of vary for, for company to company also. The, this is not a complete list, by the way. I just typed some stuff on there. The list is, should be much, much larger than that. And not, 
The other thing is not all activities apply to every project. There's no sense in me to worry about a cloud activity if I'm not doing cloud stuff or mobile stuff or whatever it is. Where the SAM falls down and the Microsoft SDL falls down and many of the other SDL, SDLCs just totally fail is right here. It's in the atypical SDL activities. And those are things where it's not just about coding and testing. Security takes more to get done. Real security is bigger than that. So we have to worry about role engineering. How many of you, how many of you ever have to deal with role engineering or identity and access management? I just ask you that because I need a drink. I don't really care. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> the, uh, with that, you look at role engineering, that's a huge part, and it needs to be done on every project. But a lot of times those SDLs, they don't mention it. They don't have it in there. So this gives us a way to, to do that and say, hey, you need to put your access request in because those security people are so slow, it's going to take you six months to get it back. But you need to do it now. You know, we go all through that. Disaster recovery. Did you do your disaster recovery setup? Did you do your scripting, your documentation, or whatever else it took? So we can add all that in there. Uh, the most interesting one on this page is actually toward the bottom. It's the security retrospective. The very last thing you do in your project for security is you sit down and you talk about what went good, what went bad, wrong, and so forth with security on a particular project. And then you give feedback amongst your team and feedback back to security. Those are great things to happen. So what you're asking me now is, oh, God, look at all the, you've now buried me in a bunch of stuff. What can I do to pull all this together? Who can I get to actually do something with this that was going to make everybody do this and keep them all together? You need a ranger Rick, right? You need a ranger Rick who will come in, or self-organize, and, and, and keep you all going. Well, you probably don't need the post-apocalyptic Ranger Rick. You probably need some more like a park ranger or a guide or, or something like that. What you actually need is a security owner. Just like in Scrum, roles in Scrum. We familiar with roles in Scrum? That kind of thing? If we have a security owner, we could actually assign someone the role, not the job, the role of being the security owner for a team. And that way, that one person, I could train that one person to use the SDL. I could train them to know about the security concerns and so forth. And they could be basically the keeper of my checklist. So I could train this security owner to be that primary contact because I don't know if you've all had to work with ITIL and stuff like that, but a big thing with ITIL is you want one hand to shake one throat to choke. You know, that's what you want with ITIL. You don't really want 17 people being responsible. You know, you want one to be accountable for that. They're accountable for the activities. So that gives us a person to do this, but we, we're missing another piece. We really need a place to put this. And I, I've looked and looked and looked and tried to figure this out. And this is the cheap budget, no frills way. A wiki. It does really have what you need to set this up. You need flexible, smart pages. You need a knowledge base. You need easy access and update. You need something that's searchable that you can work with. Well, a wiki can actually give you all that. Matter of fact, a wiki, you know, it really is that, to, you know, to the extreme because it gives you the easy formatting. It gives you categories. It's kind of the whole crowdsourcing, crowd-driven thing. And we'll take a look at that here in just a, just a second. Um, so, SharePoint, are we SharePoint people? SharePoint can do this too, even though most of the time I don't, yeah, I don't recommend it, but anyway. So, the real implementation, even though we spent about 12 minutes on this, the real implementation list looks something like this. And I'm not about to read that. The only important thing on there is there's lots of stakeholder involvement. You need to have the developer people talking, the security people talking, the business people talking. All these people need to understand what you're trying to do with this when, you, when you're pulling it together. And, and that's really, you know, there's more to it than even this, but this really kind of shows you what it looks like. So, so now, now the big deal, 
is let's let's look at something. Let's let's take a let's take a gander. So this is a wiki uh, used PM wiki. I don't know if y'all are wiki friendly. Uh, PM wiki. I just picked a wiki. Wiki PM wiki is pretty easy. Doesn't use a database. It's easy to install. Took and put together a real basic site that allows me to basically explain these phases, show you what I was show you what I was going on, then take each one of those and break them down and show you the activities. Now what's really nice about this, if I'm doing iteration and I'm looking at iteration and I go down to look at security requirements, I can actually click on iteration, click on activities, click on the security requirements, and look at a page that describes how I should do that. This is copied straight out of the open SAM. I haven't changed or updated that any at all. But you at your company, you should write more detail in there. You should have, you know, more help. This basically just says, hey, do what's in the SAM. The nice thing about this is, as I, as I go through this, if I need a list of all activities, my, my security owner can go in and get a list of everything that I might need to do security-wise for a project. So what that means, if you're a PM, PL, Scrum Master, whatever you are, you should be able to glance at this and not be surprised because that's what happens so often is we surprise people in security. We get to the very end to go, hey, hey, we, we, we're going to run this test. It's going to take six months. You should have scheduled all that. I need 58 million user stories that talk about that. You know, that shouldn't happen. This list should prevent that to some, some degree, and your Scrum Master or PL or whoever can actually use this to see what's, see what's going on. The other important uh, one with this is you can add your own stuff. The retrospective is not in the SAM. Uh, I just added that to show you. And if you have other processes or other steps that need to be taken, you add it in here. You put it in the appropriate place. The good thing is, if I've got a group that's doing waterfall steel, I've got a group that's doing scrum, you train and point them to this, and you don't worry about whether they're doing scrum or waterfall. You, don't, you take that out of the picture altogether. You don't care anymore. You just want this checklist to be done, and that's all you want. So the good thing about the wiki is I'm able to take all of these activities and tag and put them together to where, you can see the tags down at the bottom, to where I can show you all of the activity phases, all of the, I mean, all of the iterations and so forth. I can show you all those things flat out. I can build a knowledge base to where I can start adding pages. For example, if I want to put my standards in here, I could put coding standards in the same wiki. So I could start telling people, here's the way you deal with passwords in a database. Here's the way you deal with this. Here's the way you deal with that. And I could start adding, I could go in here and add pages to actually do that, to, to support what I need to do. And because I can edit it, I could let my developers even edit it. So when they ran into issues, they could update it themselves as they found things. And that's the big agile support because I could actually take and that continuous improvement piece, I could give it back to, to the developers if that, if that makes sense. So that gives us a list. That gives us a way to actually move around. And like a security owner, you know, you can go look and see what you need to do. The nice thing about that wiki is if you normally put things in documents, you start up words, you go to words, you top top, you format it for three days, you don't get it right, it has to fit some corporate standard, you save it somewhere, you point someone at it, then when they need to see it, they have to go open it, and none and none and With this, it's all right here. When I'm looking at this, this is the document I need to see. And if I need to print it and I go to look at print, it goes into a pretty print mode. It's no no frills, here it is, go do it, you know, kind of deal. So much better, so much lower overhead than what we've seen in a lot of other places. Um, also, with the maintenance, if I was to look at this, see if I can remember this, because I don't know if, oh, okay, I've got it in there already. When I edit pages, it's that easy. I can go straight to the page, I can make changes, I can type, 
do a save and I'm, I'm done with that particular page. You actually, with these, I've got a history and I can roll it back or do whatever I need to do. Most, most wikis have that to where you can, there's varying levels of that. This one, I've got practically everything cut off because I just don't care, <laughs> you know, and, and, but others, you can, you can get all that information. Um, there are, you know, the search is there. So it, it, if I can't find it, I can, you know, hey, there it is under guidelines, you know, and so forth. Um, you know, full search, all that's there. So I think it's something that's, you know, simple. It's a simple way to give the developers a way to pull this information out because it's not, there's not a magic pill. You know, we, we, we've had discussions in the last couple of days about this kind of stuff. There's not an easy way to do this. It requires people knowing that they have to do something. It requires accountability. It requires the security people. We have a huge accountability and responsibility of giving people information, enabling people. If we sit back with our tribal knowledge and don't do something like this, we have no hope. You know, the developers won't get any better and our assurance won't get any better. Now, about the last thing on this, and I think this is kind of, kind of important, I actually started a domain. I started a domain, kicked up a domain called OpenSDL. So if you go to OpenSDL.com, there's actually this out there. And what I would like to do is, if anyone's interested in helping me build out a, a fully open, common SDL out there that actually makes sense, drop me a note. And I would love to work with you. This, like I say, I've got a domain out there. I've got a wiki set up out there. I would love to take it from this spot and really help people, you know, have a starting spot. Then we could take that wiki, slide it up into GitHub to where other people could go grab it, take it, modify it, do whatever they wanted to. So that way, if it'd be like instant SDL, you download it, you'd be ready to go with what you're seeing right here. It'd just be a, a, a flat out copy. So if you're, if you're interested in that, do do contact me. Um, matter of fact, yeah, y'all all know that it's great SDL. Um, contact me, uh, SC Monk. Uh, easiest way to get hold of me on Twitter. That's the shortest way to type. But like I say, open open SDL is is out there, and it, like I say, it would be would be kind of cool to look at. Um, so I do think the way that we enable, the way we scale, is to actually is actually give people, give people the tools and give people the knowledge and let them do it. Let them do it at their pace. Because we, we can't dictate, we know that doesn't work. So questions? From the product owner oh. role, would you at, <coughs> on some level end up putting security into even the individual stories that you're writing for a given? There are. To the point where you're doing continuous delivery on there's, there's a couple things you can do, right? There is, I have major gaps. I don't even have the security architecture to work in this project. So you may need to do an actual sprint, an architecture type sprint to fix the security problem. That's one. The second thing you would do would be, there's, you can look it up. There's like security poker, security stories. There's all kind of stuff you can do with security to where you can take and say, I, I have specific backlog items that say that I have this particular security deal. Or you can get all, you know, get all detailed and in each one of your stories, you know, expand it out a little bit and say, you know, depending on your story, because I, I don't know. I don't know if you're going to say as a whatever or if you're just going to try to write it into the, write it into the story. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. It's just work. It's just, it's just work. Right. Uh, we're four weeks out from delivering. 
were about to shoot me. Right. <laughs> right. Is your uh, who is testing when you do those? Is it your like your QA process part of that? Uh, or we're a very small team, so developers just do everything. Okay. But um, yeah, there's a, a person on the team who will. You want evidence of test? You know, the big thing is to have evidence of testing. That yeah. Criteria. You're non-functional. If you'll look back in one of these iterations, there's actually a non-functional requirements section that you'll see in here. And in that non-functional requirement, you should actually go in and it should be a requirement just like anything else. The problem is, is when those are broad. You know, if I make a broad non-functional requirement that touches 112 use case or user stories, it gets a little bit more complicated at that point. So that's why you still need a security owner to think to apply that. You know, so that's why your security owner is still important. You, From experience, you, educating oh. the developers consistently across the team also helps with that because they, they each then mentally are saying, okay, so you're going to get upset with me if I don't pass this test and this test and this. I know, so just go ahead and do it for you. Yeah. Well, so maybe the project manager, own, like, for example, like every new feature that comes up, you have generic information sitting out there, I'm sure it would be the PM's job to start putting those non functional security requirements in there, or would that be? Well, I think I think there's a, there there you got two. The thing it depends on the team. It depends on how the team is going. Who puts the normal requirements out there anyway? If your team does that, well, then you've got to have a team. You know, it needs to be a group effort. If it if everything comes in through the product owner or the or the whoever, they need to do it. You, you know what I'm saying? It really depends on the way your how do you get requirements in there anyway? Uh, because really these are. Security requirements are business requirements. I, I mean, that's at the end of the day, it really is. It's just another, another piece of, I think we had a question back there, I've been trying to, trying to point. Looking at one per team, because it's not a full time, I mean, it's not as bad as it sounds, because what they'll do up front is, is they're gonna know what kind of project they're on, so they'll need to go pull that list. And then really it is building that backlog or whatever of all those items. So most of those items go, will go in there as one-time shot deals. It's more complicated when we were talking about if I'm on lots of iterations, how do I keep... I've got to have somebody review every iteration. Are there security things I need to pull back in? And that's all they'll really need to do, and maybe you get the rest of the team to do the work, if that makes sense. So you can cover multiple teams. Well, no, I don't know how you're working... We don't cross teams on our agile, on our agile stuff anyway. We we keep the uh, the teams are pretty much set. Yeah, that's why I'm saying this is a role, not a job. <laughs> you know, this isn't. This we're is not. You know, your developer, you just because it could be if you've got a scrum master, your scrum master may take it. Yeah. You know. Right. We, we have an ARM group, a group called ARM. It's Advocates of Risk Management. It's kind of like Boy Scout, Girl, Girl Scout, Rangers, whatever. We have that group in our company, and what we do is we kind of train people randomly across all the development environment so they know more about security. So if there's an ARM member on one of the Agile teams, We'll tag that person to be the security owner because they know more just through their training about security. So you're still coming back around as an overall governance group, and you're still going to have all your gut. There are certain things that you must do because of audit, because of compliance, because of whatever. There still has to be an amount of governance there. Absolutely, can't get away from that. Any other questions? Y'all, y'all are like, I'm kind of disappointed in this side of the room. Questions? <laughs> Because <laughs> <laughs> see, I am a okay. What I do is mostly information assurance. More on the government side. I mean, I'm contractor based. I'm dealing with a lot of developers. I'm the only one in that security realm, and they just go, "We develop. You deal with the security piece." So I, I'm listening to y'all going, "What? Well, that's great. Are y'all hiring?" Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not. I don't get that. I'm, I'm the one having to do all the security, and they just go, here, we've done our part, go do it. 
So this is good. The way y'all do that is good. It's uh, I will say from works. experience, most developers, if you just explain to them yeah. the common yes. problems, like here, don't make this classic mistake with a right. SQL injection or whatever, they'll learn and, and do it the right way because they know better now. Right, and they're okay with doing that part of it. It's just that other piece of the whole, I don't know, it's, it's almost like there's a miscommunication that we're still growing and learning how to communicate and talk the same language kind of thing. So I'm getting there. It's just... But it, that, that would be, I mean, we did retrospectives not at the end of our project just, but w when you add security to your retrospective at a, like, to the, on the sprints, so that you're talking Oh, about, you could do that, yeah. You've been able to address right. this, you know, right. are you addressing security and make it part of maybe, if it's, if it's a real issue, make it part of your standard. Uh, you do want to do an overall because what we, we will find overall is there are things that you may need to change about the entire processes you may not know until the end you know and sometimes you don't end you know so you have to really do it there but I, I wouldn't neglect an overall an overall retrospective to truly look back and say what was our real because then you can look at each sprint and kind of you could do that as you went but I don't know that it gives you the same the same impact I don't know that anything's wrong I can't see the time for the glare so we may be out of time one more question four minutes oh okay not a question, got four minutes. Any other questions? Do, like I say, do send me a note if you want to uh, talk more about the open SDL. Like I say, that's something I would kind of like to look at and, and grow. Um, like I say, if you have any questions, want to talk about agile, security, whatever, just you know, drop a note. I'm always babbling, you know, so about something. And uh, hopefully this will, I'll, Go to this site and I'll make the presentation available out there too. Not on the B side plus side. Don't know not I don't know where how we're doing this quite yet on the what on the availability, I have to see. Okay. Thank you very much.